So moving on with electroacoustical calibration. So a little bit more information about um, how the sensitivity of the microphone that's used on the SLM uh, is, uh, well, decided. The calibration reference sound pressure threshold, uh, we know, the re uh, what we call as a reference equivalent threshold is, uh, is 20 micropascals, which we consider the threshold of hearing. Um, so the nominal sensitivity of uh, any um, precision microphone is about 50 millivolts uh, per pascal. So if you were to use the threshold of hearing 20 micropascals into this mm -hmm. equation, uh, we'll quickly determine that the sensitivity of a typical microphone is about one microvolt. So for instance, so if, if it was to capture a sound that is right at threshold of 20 micropascals, uh, the output uh, of the microphone would be one microvolts, which uh, again, this would be the one microvolts that's fed into the sound level meter. Um, again, so the present standard is, is uh, 20 microvolts, uh, micro, I'm sorry, micropascals is it's considered the threshold of hearing. And as I mentioned, when we talked about the decibels, uh, that's based on the on the average normal hearing person, a sample of the average normal hearing person. But of course, if there is something that's dramatically changed in, in, in a decade or so, then one would have to change this reference value depending upon what's considered uh, the normal hearing threshold uh, at that period. So that might change. So uh, to be conservative, uh, at least in reference journals, uh, uh, and when you're talking about specifications of acoustical or, or audiological equipment, uh, one would say that the sound level meter is measuring in uh, the standard that it's using is one microvolts uh, for zero dB uh, is equivalent to zero dB, and here the zero dB is referenced to 20 micropascals. Uh, Again, for, for an example, if, if there was another application where the dB scale is used, for instance, like, let's say, um, a measurement of um, catastrophic events or measurement of um, uh, communication between marine animals, uh, then you might use, instead of using 20 micropascals, there might be another standard that's compared uh, that's used as uh, the, the reference when reporting the dB scale. But for, of course, clinical audiology, we're interested with human listeners, so 20 microvolts is what, uh, micropascals is what we are uh, keeping as a reference right now. So even before you start using your sound level meter uh, for, for the calibration of your audiometer, uh, one thing, the sound level meter itself needs to be calibrated. So one, if one gets to observe an engineer uh, doing this calibration, the first thing the, the individual would do uh, would be to make sure the sound level meter is calibrated by itself. Often they would bring along with them uh, a standard sound generator, uh, and um, uh, in many cases it's known as a piston phone or sometimes just a calibrator phone, uh, which produces uh, a, a very consistent output amplitude at a certain frequency. Um, so for instance, the B and K 4220 uh, piston phone uh, emits a 123.8 dBSPL uh, at 250 hertz uh, if it was presented in normal conditions and normal pressure. So if that was, if that piston phone was connected to the sound level meter uh, and if you were to engage it uh, the output of the sound level emitter should be should exactly read 123.8 dBSPL. However, if it is anything different than that, uh, then one would have to use a correction factor. So different sized microphones require different adapters for coupling, uh, and they should be available for the piston phone that you're using. What is desired is uh, uh, and what is permitted is a plus or minus 0.2 dB. Uh, if it's anything more than that, uh, if the sound level meter is reading any other reading other than plus or minus 0.2 dB with reference to this 123.8 dB SPL, uh, again, if you were using this BNK4220, uh, 
uh, one would have to use a correction factor for the final output of the sound level meter when, when you're doing your audiometric calibration. Again, when you're connecting your sound level meter uh, and microphone combination to the audiometer, depending upon what transducer you use, you would have to select an appropriate coupler. Again, the intention of this coupler is to mimic the mechanical properties of the external ear uh, when, uh, when an earphone or an insert earphone or a bone vibrator uh, is placed on, on an average adult head. Um, so you, you need to use a standardized acoustical coupler. Um, again, if you are using a supraoral headphone, uh, you would have to simulate or approximate the volume between the diaphragm of the headphone and the tympanic membrane. Um, so your coupler uh, would have an approximate volume of six cubic centimeter. Um, so for the TDH39 uh, headphone. So there are different couplers available. Uh, some are known as ear simulators or artificial ears. Again, uh, and there's a, here's a definition of the artificial ear. Uh, uh, the idea is to uh, simulate the acoustic impedance uh, that's presented by the average normal ear. So here is a schematic illustration of the setup used for the audiometric calibration. Um, so your um, sound level meter um, might be connected to a computer. I think most recent digital ones are connected to a computer so you can readily see the output of the sound level meter in a table and you can input those findings into a software. I think uh, when the GSI person is going to be calibrating uh, the audiometer, audiometers in our clinics, uh, he has it set up that it's connected directly to a computer. Uh, but the sound level meter is going to be having a microphone at the end, uh, and depending upon what transducer you use, you might use different couplers. So all these are different couplers that are used. Uh, this would be an artificial ear, uh, which where which you would use for supraoral headphone calibration. Uh, this is a two cc coupler. Uh, that's used for insert earphones. The coupler that's used for insert earphones is quite simple. Uh, pretty much it looks like a, a, a standard metal cylinder uh, of a known volume. So in this case it's 2cc, uh, again which simulates the, the volume between the tympanic membrane and the end of the insert earphone. Uh, and you, you can um, you can predict that the volume is lesser uh, when you're engaging a insert earphone versus a supraoral headphone, hence it's uh, just 2cc. And then you don't have the, uh, to simulate the, the tension of the headband, um, which you would have when you're using a supraoral headphone. Um, so hence it's more a simpler apparatus that you're using for the insert earphone couplers. And, and one of the reason one of the reasons why insert earphones are more prevalent in clinical uh, testing uh, for air conduction testing. Uh, so it's the ease in which you can calibrate it. And second, it's more hygienic because you're using more uh, disposable ear tips um, for the patients. Uh, uh, so here is a coupler that's known as a bone uh, artificial mastoid, uh, a coupler that you use to simulate um, um, the mastoid uh, mechanical impedance, um, and of course when you're testing bone vibrators. The difference again from using uh, insert earphones and uh, and uh, uh, supraoral earphones, um, and for for that matter loudspeakers. Uh, versus those, the calibration that you do for a uh, bone vibrator uh, is that you would not be using a microphone, but you would be using an accelerometer, uh, which converts mechanical vibration uh, into electrical energy, uh, again, which would be read by the sound level meter. Uh, while uh, for uh, air conduction testing uh, calibration, uh, you would have to use a microphone to convert the acoustical energy into uh, electrical energy. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, the supraoral earphone calibration. Um, 
So here uh, again is an uh, illustration of it's a photo actually of uh, the artificial ear. Um, so this is actually a tension band, um, and between these two, the cavity, which is that uh, approximating the six cc cavity, um, is where you're going to be placing the supraural earphone. Again, each earphone is tested individually. It would be removed from the headband placed face down uh, on this dome and you would have to adjust the tension uh, approximately, I mean, approximately up to 500 grams. Again, um, the standard tension that you would, uh, you would, one would use when placing the headphones on the ears. Uh, once the tension is set up, um, you would connect the base of the artificial ear to the sound level meter. Um, uh, with, with its microphone. So when you're calibrating insert earphones, again, it's uh, the coupler is a little more simple. So in this case, this would be a 2cc coupler, uh, and this would be actually the microphone and preamplifier. Uh, again, the, the end, this, this is the end where the sound level meter is attached to. Um, at the other end over here, you would have a facility to attach the the plastic tubing of the insert earphone, uh, and so this would this would be the setup that you use for insert earphone calibration. Uh, for bone conduction calibration, you would uh, employ an artificial mastoid. Uh, again, you would have to simulate the tension of the headband. So the bone vibrator, the, the kind of the rectangular part of the bone vibrator would be removed from the headband and it would be placed um, with, with its bottom down over here, um, while the base of the artificial mastoid would be connected to the sound level meter. So an artificial mastoid is a type of accelerometer uh, which produces a proportional electrical current uh, to the to the mechanical vibration of the the bone vibrator. Uh, again, the uh, this uh, as a coupler, it simulates a mechanical impedance that's offered by the mastoid of the average human head with the bone vibrator placed. So the, with a the clamp, uh, you would simulate the tension uh, that the that the headband places uh, puts on uh, when the bone vibrator is placed on the mastoid, uh, and approximately the load is about 540 grams, uh, and uh, the the band would help you confirm whether you're being you're maintaining that 540 grams of tension. So there's an electrical coupling now. Again, it's not an acoustical coupling. So an electrical coupling between the sound level meter and the artificial mastoid. Uh, so the connection to the SLM by the cable uh, replaces that of the microphone that's used for the rest of the calibration. Again, so this is a setup over here. So the SLM, at the end of the SLM, we don't have a microphone here, but it's directly connected uh, through a preamplifier to the artificial mastoid, uh, which artificial mastoid is, is going to convert the mechanical vibration into electrical equivalent uh, and that's going to be fed to the sound level meter to be measured. So the reference values uh, are the, for the sound level meter is going to be in terms of uh, sound pressure level um, and, uh, and the reference is going to be 20 micropascals. So these are the standards that are set by uh, ANSI and the International Standards Institute. Uh, that, set to record um, the caliber of the audiometer and reach 0 dB hearing level, HL. So this in for, uh, for the air conduction uh, transducers, uh, these reference values are what we call as reference equivalent threshold sound pressure level, uh, RETSPL. Uh, for the bone vibrator testing, uh, we're going to be using the reference equivalent threshold force levels. Again, uh, we've seen this equal loudness contours before. Um, so again, the idea of using uh, different reference equivalent threshold sound pressure levels is to uh, 
to into account in the differential frequency sen sensitivity we have for frequencies. So in other words, converting the dBSBL for any given frequency into its equivalent dBHL. For these values, the RETSPL values, not only depend upon the frequency, but they also depend upon the transducer that we use, whether the transducer is an insert earphone, supraural headphone, uh, loudspeakers, or a bone vibrator. Uh, so, for instance, if the audiometer is set to produce a certain dBHL, let's say it's N, uh, and for an example, let's say it's 60 dB, uh, then its output measured uh, with an appropriate acoustical or mechanical coupler uh, at the level of the sound level meter it needs to be N plus R dBSPL where in this case where R is the specified reference equivalent level at that frequency. So here is an example of uh, difference reference equivalent thresholds uh, for uh, for a superoral earphone. So in this case, uh, if it's uh, N is 60 dB, uh, let's say 1000 Hertz, um, the output, so if you're presenting a 1000 Hertz stimulus and you're recording the output with superoral headphones uh, with an artificial ear and sound level meter, uh, if the audiometer is calibrated right, the output should be 67 dB SPL. Uh, because that would be 60 dB plus the 7 dB reference equivalent threshold SPL. Uh, then if you move on to test at 4000 Hz, for instance, um, then and keeping the audiometer at, at 60 dB, the output at the level of the sound low limiter needs to be 69.5 dB SPL uh, to be considered within, within calibration. So if it's not within calibration, uh, then one would have to... Uh, well, what one needs to make, the engineer usually will make an adjustment of the diameter under the calibration mode uh, and to ensure that it reaches that calibrated value of 69.5 dB at 4000 Hz. Again, depending upon the transducer, you'll have different uh, reference equivalent threshold SPLs and FLs. So here are examples of um, two different types of uh, headphones. Superall headphones here, TDH39, Bayer DT48, uh, and another another earphone over here. So you can see that the values slightly differ depending upon the type of the headphone. So hence, again, the need uh, to stress that you don't switch headphones even though they look alike. Uh, in some cases, even within even if it's TDH39s. As I said, any one given uh, headphone might be slightly off, say, say at, uh, at 500 hertz, it might be 2 dB off, but then you're going to compensate it with the audiometer. Uh, so if you switch that headphone with a, a the room from, with a headphone in the adjacent audiometric room, uh, you would actually um, affect the calibration. So here are uh, reference equivalent uh, SPL for insert earphones, RTSPLs for insert earphones. Uh, and in general, you would appreciate that um, the, the insert earphones, the corrections are lesser uh, than for superoral headphones. Again, it's because of the smaller volume between the uh, uh, end of the insert earphone and the eardrum. Uh, for the insert earphones versus those for superall headphones. And then we know as we are measuring pressure, so as the volume, uh, as the area reduces, uh, the pressure increases. Um, so there are, well, totally the, the correction values are uh, smaller uh, for insert earphones versus superall headphones. And when you're doing audiometric calibration, uh, it's always done at a higher level, uh, again, uh, usually around 60 to 75 dB, uh, to just ensure that you're above the noise floor, so the noise floor doesn't influence, especially when you're testing the lower frequencies. Um, so you would add whatever RTSPL is uh, to the the level that you're, you're, you're playing the different tones in the audiometer, so let's say 60 dB, uh, so RTSPL values would be added on to that 60 dB, um, 
uh, six dBHL to to confirm um, the output at the level of the sound level meter. So here's an example of a certificate uh, that's uh, usually given uh, along with uh, uh, along with the calibration. Uh, so there's different uh, different types of calibration done. So far, we've talked only about amplitude calibration, uh, but uh, simultaneously, the engineer would also do a frequency calibration. In other words, you will make sure that when you're presenting 250 hertz, the, the tone is, is in fact 250 hertz uh, and such. Uh, and then they'll do amplitude calibration for uh, depending upon uh, I mean for the different transducers. They'll also calibrate the no narrow by noise. They'll check if there's any distortion in the tones um, and also check for the sound field uh, for the loudspeakers. The sound field would be calibrating the loudspeakers. Uh, and one would also measure the ambient noise at the different frequencies uh, to make sure that we meet the standard of ambient noise uh, in the clinical test environment. Okay, so what is what are the permissible uh, tolerances for the dB output uh, for an audiometer to be considered within uh, to be within calibration? Uh, the output of the D, uh, of any given transducer needs to be plus or minus three dB uh, for up to four thousand hertz, and uh, plus or minus five dB uh, for six to eight kilohertz. Uh, a note of caution that when you're doing bone uh, conduction uh, calibration, one would actually calibrate both for forehead and mastoid placements. Uh, the reason why you might want to do, especially if you're a clinic seeing a lot of infants, uh, it, it would be important to do a, a forehead uh, calibration also uh, because uh, many instances you might be using the bone vibrator on the forehead and not on the mass for this uh, for these young small heads. Uh, you need to remember that the forehead levels range uh, typically higher up to like 8 to 14 dB higher um, then the reference force values for the mastoid. Uh, so in other words, um, the, there's more fatty tissue in the forehead, and uh, and these are these are infants might not have their fontanelle completely closed. In other words, uh, the the skull bones completely fused. Um, so their actually thresholds might be eight to fourteen dB higher uh, if when, compared to if they if we were to put thresholds on the mastoids. Apart from just uh, the output level um, for the different um, frequencies, one would also do a linearity check. Um, so it's usually done only at one frequency. Uh, here you want to make sure that not only at, at a single level the output is right, uh, but it also linearly increases or decreases if you would increase or decrease the attenuator. Um, so usually it will set the audiometer at its maximum output uh, and attenuate or reduce in 5 dB steps and you expect to see a proportional change in the sound level meter. Um, and uh, according to the standards it shouldn't be more than 3.5 to 6.5 dB change. Within the, it should be approximately equivalent to the change that you're making in the audiometer. One other aspect that you do calibration is for crosstalk. Uh, so here you're checking for uh, is there any energy in the non-test earphone? And this is essentially by testing the attenuator uh, dial, usually set it up at 60 dB uh, with the tone off, and then you make a measurement. And so um, you, you don't expect to see any energy at all, and according to the standards, if you do see an energy, it needs to at least be 70 dB below uh, in the hear, earphone that you're not presenting the signal. So frequency check, again, you'll be checking whether uh, uh, the frequency is calibrated for the different pure tones that you're using. Uh, so the recorder frequency should be within 1% of the stated frequency for type 1. Again, type 1 audiometers are diagnostic audiometers. Um, so most of the audiometers, that, you know, all the audiometers that we're using uh, for in the clinical um, comprehensive evaluations are type 1 audio audiometers. Uh, there might be a few type 2 and 3 audiometers that we use for screening, uh, 
for those audiometers, uh, you can uh, the, the permitted frequency needs to be within two percent of the stator frequency. Uh, for example, of that, would be if an audiometer dial reads five hundred hertz. If it was a diagnostic audiometer, type one audiometer. Uh, the output, the frequency that you're recording in the sound level meter should be uh, within 495 hertz or 505 hertz. So here are some equipment that you're using uh, for the calibration of audiometers. Again, a schematic illustration. Um, so of course you got the audiometer with the different transducers, a bone vibrator, or super oil headphone. Again, they're going to be connected by uh, um, the appropriate couplers. Uh, so if it was uh, air conduction testing, acoustical calibration, then you're going to have a preamplifier, a microphone, connecting that to the sound level meter. Uh, if it was a bone vibrator, an artificial mastoid, you would have an accelerometer connected to the sound level meter. Sound level meter by itself might be connected to some filter sets which you would engage, if, especially if you're doing pure tone calibration. You might have an oscilloscope. An oscilloscope is uh, a device where you uh, you can see the waveform of the different signals that are input to it. Uh, it reads electrical signals, so the output of the sound level meter can be fed into an oscilloscope, uh, and you can see the waveform. You might use a frequency meter for frequency calibration. And you might use a spectrum analyzer, especially when you're looking for distortion or if you're looking at rise and fall time calibration. That's something that we're going to be talking in a short bit. One other thing that you look for in frequency is also harmonic distortion. So it refers to if there's any higher harmonics uh, within the original pure tone. Okay, pure tone by its definition should have only a single frequency. But because of some distortions within the headphone, there might be other harmonics uh, in the output. Uh, essentially, often it's found that faulty transducers result in the odd harmonics, namely the third, fifth, and seventh. Uh, but what's important is that um, it's within permissible levels. Um, okay, so one would actually measure the total harmonic distortion uh, it's a measure of the harmonic distortion uh, quoted as a percentage. So in, in, by definition, it's a ratio of the total power contained in these um, distortion or artifactual harmonics uh, in comparison to the fundamental tone. For bone conduction signals, the total harmonic distortion must not exceed 5.5%. Uh, so the energy in the harmonics may be at least 26 dB below the level of the test signal. For air conduction signals, the total energy in the harmonics uh, must be at least 32 dB below the test signal. Uh, especially the level of the second harmonic must be uh, no more than 2% of the level of the intended harmonic because it's a very close to harmonic. Um, and so you need to make sure that it's at, at a, a very low level compared to the primary tone. So in the, here, in this, uh, here's an example where uh, the primary tone is 1000 hertz at uh, close to 120 dB SPL. The second uh, harmonic uh, is at uh, 83 dB SPL, um, so it doesn't exceed uh, the 2% the rule, 2% uh, of the test signal the SPL. So this is this is actually fine. Another aspect of the tone that one would do calibration is to make sure the rise and the fall time is within uh, permissible levels. So according to the standard, the rise and the fall times of the tones must not be less than 20 milliseconds. Um, so when you're measuring from the point in which the tone is at 10% of its maximum amplitude to the point at which it's 90% of its maximum amplitude. So um, the following slide has an illustration which would be easy to uh, make this point. So let's say this is a, a standard pure tone. This is, you're looking at a waveform. Uh, so the rise time would be the time that one uh, uh, the amplitude changes from 10% of the maximum amplitude to 90% of the maximum amplitude. And vice versa, the fall time would be uh, again from 90% of the maximum amplitude to 10% of the maximum amplitude as a tone trails off. Uh, according to the standards, it should be more than 20 milliseconds. 
Again, the idea is to make sure it's not too short and abrupt because we know that when stimulus are short and abrupt, it results in that spectral splatter. Uh, again, spectral splatter is undesirable when in pure tone audiometry. The last point, again, I want to stress is that audiometers and headphones are calibrated together as a unit. Swapping headphones changes calibration, so don't do that.